Have you ever had an epiphany where a, a large idea just kind of clicked into place in your head and you realize that you should have realized this a long time ago? That's what happens to a lot of people when they finally understand that we're facing ecological and societal problems with the use of fossil fuels for the last 200 years causing climate change and the finite nature of fossil fuels. People often get depressed or they have a pretty visceral reaction to what's going on. And that realization can be scary. And there's a lot of books and shows and podcasts and speakers and organizations working to raise awareness of the climate crisis and the coming end of fossil fuels and the, the change that our societies are going to need to undergo. But I don't really talk about them so much on this podcast because I take it kind of for written or as, as I take it for granted that people have that understanding and that that's why they're coming to listen to our podcast. But I realized recently that that's not everyone is already at that place. And so today we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that as a meta idea. And I'm going to be joined by my friend Kate. And uh, yeah, we'll go back and forth and talk a little bit about the realization of coming catastrophe potentially or great change, I guess is a more neutral way to say it. And how people deal with that differently and how they come to that realization and what to do about it once you do. Um, so we're going to take a step back from the usual kind of look at specific things and look at larger concept in, in general. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 59 on November 18th, 2022, coming to you out of the Low Tech Institute's recording room in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. And today I'm joined by a friend of the Institute, Kate Ingold, to talk about how people come to realize climate and fossil fuel changes in our future are real. We'll also have Institute updates. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org, for more. There you can find out more about our podcast, as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts. Unless you hear me doing the ad, someone else is making money on that advertising. While all our podcast videos and other information are given freely, they do take resources to make. And if you're in a position to help support our work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute. If you'd like to sponsor an episode directly, please get in touch with us through our website, lowtechinstitute.org. Joining me today is Kate Ingold, who is an LA-based interdisciplinary artist who thinks uh, deeply about an individual's place within our world and society. But I've known her since grad school days in New Orleans when our dogs would play at the dog park and her partner and I were in the same department. Uh, and Kate was the first official member of the Low Technology Institute and has been supporting our work in concrete and conceptual ways uh, since then. So thanks so much for coming to chat with me today, Kate. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm super excited. So, we always have very interesting conversations. So I know this yeah, one will be too. Yeah, that's kind of why I wanted, we kind of talked about some of this stuff last week and I thought, oh, this would be really useful to hear because what we're talking about today is the fact that um, I feel like sometimes or often or almost all the time in this podcast, uh, we kind of gloss over the fact that there is a huge change coming and we gloss over the fact that that change is coming and just get on to, you know, what we think of as solutions or ideas about how we can house, clothe and feed ourselves once we don't have fossil fuels as climate changes, all these things. But we sometimes I neglect to realize that not everybody is in that place to ready to discuss that they're still coming to grips with the fact that that big change is coming. And so, you know, in the last three or four weeks, I've had three people contact me in different ways saying, hey, I just realized that uh, it was either because of the UN panel, uh, IPCC report, or uh, different uh, news reports or different things. And finally it just clicked for them. Oh my God, our world is changing really uh, profoundly in the next uh, decades. Um, and I, I don't feel prepared for that. And then they, one of my friends who I've known for years said, now I realize what you've been doing all this time. <laughs> it's like, oh, I guess I haven't been articulating what I'm trying to do. Uh, if you just realize it, because I've been saying it, uh, or I feel like I've been saying it, but I guess everybody comes to it at their own pace. H how did you come to realize things are going to change, Kate? Uh, you know, it's so interesting you ask that, because I'm trying to think of when. When did I first become 
Hmm. I think it was a long time ago because, you know, I remember when Al Gore's movie came out, Inconvenient Truth, I went to see it. I went to, actually, I went to a fundraiser. We were we were here in um, LA just visiting because at the time, Sonny and I were living in New Orleans. I'm pretty sure it's probably 2003, maybe or something. Wow. And we went to an event here that uh, had uh, John Bon Jovi singing Living on a Prayer and uh, acoustically and Al Gore was there and it was all about the, an inconvenient truth and talking about climate change and what was coming. And at that point we were already, I mean, I, I can speak for both of us, but certainly I had already been kind of engaged in the issue for a while. So where did it come from? I'm not sure. Probably just from, you know, I'm, I love documentaries. And so I, re I watch a lot of documentaries and so it just kind of came into it. And then by the mid 2000s, it, you know, it seemed quite urgent. Certainly the election, the, you know, the Bush v. Gore election, and then afterwards felt like, holy cow, you know, what are we going to do? And at that point, I, I think I followed a typical American trajectory where a lot of my energy was going towards changing the way I did things mm -hmm. in the house, mm -hmm. you know, so somewhat, I mean, not the really big, not really, really big things, but cutting down on plastic, trying to getting rid of no, no longer using paper towels, no longer, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah. No longer using li liquid soap, you know, trying, yeah. trying to find a decent shampoo that was a bar shampoo that that was a really interesting kind of trip. Um, you know, looking, having, <laughs> having that kind of eye opening yeah. experience of going into the grocery store and not seeing anything that wasn't made of plastic and, and really, you know, con conceptualizing like this mm -hmm. is a forever object. And what mm -hmm. does it mean to be using a forever object in a daily throwaway way? Yeah, just in the last uh, episode where I talked about thatch, you know, I said in the yes. beginning, think of every single shingle on a roof that you've ever seen still exists somewhere in the world. Just think of all the houses you've ever seen and all the shingles that are on all those houses. They're still there or they're still somewhere. Um, it's just <laughs> insanity. Um, and yeah, so for me, the realization came... Uh, when I finished, or when I was finishing writing a book called uh, Why Did Ancient Civilizations Fail, which was not the title I would have chosen. Um, it was called, I want to call it Hubris, but uh, my editor said, you can't call a book Hubris. That's hubris. Anyway, uh, and so basically the premise of the book is, you know, all these ancient civilizations or large scale complex societies also crashed and burned and they didn't see it coming. And they had been very successful for hundreds of years building up these really complex societies. And they didn't believe it could happen to them. And that was part of their downfall because if it can't happen to you, you don't need to adapt to a changing world. And, you know, we certainly do the same thing. We don't, we don't think that things are going to change. And so we don't change anything. And then we actually have major catastrophes. So I got really depressed. And for me, mm -hmm. you know, noodling around on the web, I finally found somewhere called the dark, the dark mountain project and they have a manifesto out, mm -hmm. but basically it was a whole bunch of people who had been active mostly in the UK, but around the world in, climate actions, uh, protests, different things around different causes. And then, you know, they, they came to the realization, hey, this is existential. This is an existential threat. And nobody's really listening. If they were listening and understood the reality of this, people would actually be doing something. And they're not. And mm -hmm. so they basically said, okay, we're done telling you. We've been telling you, you're not listening. So let's kind of not drop out, but let's, you know, talk amongst ourselves. Let's come up with stories that help push this narrative forward that maybe would work in a different way than, mm -hmm. you know, just presenting facts to people, which hasn't been working for a large number of people. So, yeah. And yeah, one, one of my friends, I doubt he'll mind me mentioning, he's a historical reenactor. Mm -hmm. He does period construction methods and uh, skills and things like that. And he called me the other day and we had been at a uh, event making buckets, wooden buckets. And uh, he had been giving me a hard time all day because I was using mix of modern and pre-industrial type techniques and tools. And he was using like tools he had forged himself in a blacksmithing shop. And he was like, I've been working on this bucket for 10 years off and on because, you know, I had to make the tools and I had to make all this stuff. And, and at the end of the day, I had a bucket and he was, you know, didn't. And he was kind of giving me a hard time. He's like, yeah, but you know, this is the traditional way to do it. And then like a couple of weeks later, he called me and said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean, I hope you weren't insulted. I just didn't realize that you're doing like post industrial technology, mm. whereas I'm doing mm. pre-industrial technology. I'm trying to preserve that. And he's like, I'm, you know, I just realized how important what you're doing is as opposed to what I'm doing, which is just kind of like, you know, cosplaying. I'm like, well, no, but it's also important. We need those skills. We need to know how to do those things. So I was trying to talk because he said I was that he was reading the IPCC report and he got really depressed. And so, you know, 
it it happens for different reasons for different people. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I'm thinking of two other things that were kind of eye-opening experiences for me, even mm -hmm. though I was aware of climate change, but that also, mm -hmm. you know, increased my involvement perhaps or, in, or engagement with the issue. The first was a talk that Thich Nhat Hanh gave back in 2004, I want to say, uh -huh. that was on the environment. And his lectures, you know, were quite long. It was a two hour lecture. His lectures were very long and they were very slow paced, you know, mm -hmm. which is kind of a wonderful thing about how he approached yeah. things. Uh, but within it, he really talks about, you know, interconnectedness and impermanence mm -hmm. and r reminding that, you know, our civilization will someday end, that there's mm -hmm. the earth itself will end. Mm -hmm. um, that all things are impermanent, including our universe you know, on these really large scales. Yeah. And his teaching really was that, you know, once you are accepting that reality, mm -hmm. you are called to care for what, what is here today. Yeah. And, you know, and he talks about it within inter, interpersonal relationships where he gives a, a lesson on, not a lesson, but a, a practice on if you're having a, for instance, a disagreement with your partner and you're really, really mad at them. Mm -hmm. Um, that, you know, when you, to, of course, first take a walk or something, but when you come back <laughs> to have the conversation to, you know, when you hug each other, to think of yourselves in a hundred years. Hmm. And, you know, what does just, just think of that, and that, that's the only teaching, yeah. you know, how does your relationship with that person change with that? So that was one. The second one was when Captain Charles Moore um, first documented the so-called Pacific garbage patch, you know, mm -hmm. the Pacific Ocean gar yeah. garbage patch, exactly. and then becoming aware of like plastic and thinking of plastic as being this forever thing. And yeah. I started following the work of this artist, Chris Jordan, who had been photographing albatross mm -hmm. birds in Midway, mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, who yeah. were dying from plastic and, in, you know, and eventually he made a, in a beautiful, absolutely beautiful film that he offered to the world for free called Albatross that we should also link to because everyone should see this film. And his, his approach was, he believed that if you see the beauty, if you see the beauty and you fall in love with it, you will have no choice but to change the way you are. Yeah. You know, that we can't face it. We can't see, you know, these beautiful birds, for instance, being killed mm -hmm. by eating all this plastic and still go into the grocery store and not have you know not say i can't actually use that i can't get that yeah, yeah. so i need to change my life mm -hmm. you know so that that is looking for that in a way that that koan experience yeah. of there it is right there right a you know a strike a strike of lightning and your enlightenment has occurred mm -hmm. yeah and uh although on the lighter side uh george carlin had this whole bit uh before he passed away about how you know humans are so self-centered that they think the earth evolved evolved them so that there would be people on the earth and he said no 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 the earth evolved us for one reason plastic the earth wanted plastic <laughs> and it needed us to create it and now it has as much plastic as it needs so it's trying to kill us off so it can just be alone with its plastic <laughs> Okay. I remember that bit. That was really yeah. hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it is a wonderful, like, light way of approaching the, you know, who was it that called us the plastic people? There's an archaeologist who termed that. Do you remember who that person No, um, I don't. Shame on me. I'll look it up. Uh, but saying that, you know, that would be the thing that we will be known for, you know, oh, should there be archaeologists in 2000 years, <laughs> there will be this layer of plastic that just represents our epoch. Oh, know? yeah. It, it, it's already that case. And uh, when I worked in Guatemala, uh, you could safely dig as long as you were hitting plastic because there was so much plastic detritus that as long as you were digging through plastic, you didn't need to screen it. You didn't, you knew it was not ancient. You could just chug it. And so you could get down, you know, a foot or two real quick because there was plastic bottles. And as soon as you stopped hitting plastic, that's when you could actually start paying attention for archaeological mm. remains. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Frustrating. And yeah, so kind of these stories or you started mentioning koans, uh, I, I've been thinking recently, like, you know, everybody comes to it differently. And for me, you know, facts and figures and that sort of thing does, I guess, move the needle, I guess, in my own mind. But that's not, I'm not everybody and other people might come to it for, for different reasons. And so sometimes mm -hmm. it really grinds my gears when someone says, I believe in climate change or I believe in global warming, because on the one hand, you don't need to believe in it. <laughs> Whether you believe in it or not doesn't matter, right? So it's unlike religion in that way. However, it has yes. taken on a very religious-like space in people's world where like, I, I'm probably not going to be here in 100 years to see what 
has happened, but I'm, you know, we're taking a, on educated faith. Is that a thing that, you know, these models are, are telling us what's happening because we can see into the past, you know, when we do paleoclimatological reconstructions as archaeologists, we can see these patterns and what happened. So we can be pretty sure that if things continue as they are, it's not going to be great. And so, yeah, there is definitely some level of belief in it. And what works better for getting over complex concepts to people often are stories, right? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe stories would be a better way to get at people who don't want to look at the data, who don't want to understand the data, who don't want to think about it that way. So maybe parables or, like you said, koans, which for those that don't know, koans are short pithy, often questions that break out of the, try and break you out of the rut of your current thinking. Is that a decent way to describe it? I should ask you to Yeah. Describe. I mean, they're, they're usually like little, little short stories, essentially mm -hmm. of teachers, Zen teachers speaking to students or mm -hmm. students talking to teachers. And, and there's a dialogue usually, mm -hmm. and that dialogue, and it's, and it's usually about a student coming to a teacher talking about their practice and then Mm -hmm. the teacher saying something back and sometimes it's between a, an official like it might be a you know a uh, there's this wonderful one with this emperor and the head teacher that, and they're walking and they see this lion a, a stone lion and if i'm not going to remember it correctly shoot <laughs> but <laughs> it ends with the like the, the 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 emperor is basically like i want some teaching from you i mean tell me you know tell me what i can learn from the stone lion and from you know give me give me the dharma and the head teacher says it's my fault it's all my fault mm -hmm. and that's the only teaching right and you know so i, li I liked how uh, alan watts described them as a joke that if you're enlightened you get the joke and you laugh without thinking because that's how a joke works mm -hmm. if you have to think about it it's not you don't get the joke and mm -hmm. so the zen koans is if you have a certain understanding then it makes sense immediately. Otherwise you have to intellectually understand it. Yes, definitely. So, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. But so if one tried to, you know, if one really delved deep into the notion of taking full responsibility mm -hmm. for everything, yeah, it's all my fault. Yeah. You know, what does that mean? And, yeah. and what is, what is it to, to accept that? And what is, what, who is the I in that situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, but it, it's quite, profound you know yeah. it's, I mean, well obviously it's quite profound but it's also quite generous mm -hmm. you know to me and 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 i feel like that's part of scott i have to say that's what i feel a part of about the low technology institute and what i love about what you do it's coming from a perspective of care and generosity so wanting to help this future that you may not be alive for mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, of course, it impacts today because the present, as Thich Nhat Hanh always taught, you know, the future is made of the present moment. Yeah. The present moment is made of the past, as we know. Mm, yep. um, but, but coming from a perspective of wanting to help, wanting to be of service mm -hmm. to the future, you know, yeah. that's quite beautiful, right? That's not about it being that there's, there's a, when, when you're coming from a perspective of generosity and care and compassion, then, you know, your actions are different than they are if they're coming from a perspective of selfishness and, you know, and trying and, and absorption and self-absorption. Yeah. So. And whether you think about it that way or not, you know, our actions do have ramifications for everyone else. You know, it's, we, we pride ourselves on being so individualistic in the U S it's really difficult sometimes to make, you know, to make the point that no, we are all interconnected in some way, shape or form. And my, you know, I don't exist in a vacuum. It's kind of what you were talking about again with the faith belief you know, mm -hmm. idea that, you know, you don't have to believe in climate change for it to be real. Right. It's also true that you don't have to believe that your actions have any consequences outside of yourself, but they do, they do, you yeah. know, and, and one of the things I should say when it comes to the faith and belief idea is that the counter to that, um, something that some Zen teachers have really emphasized too, is that it's about having the wisdom, wisdom based as opposed mm -hmm. to belief or faith based. Mm -hmm. So we have the wisdom to look at the data. We have the wisdom to look at the reality of, you know, mm -hmm. massive flooding happening in Pakistan and, you know, star storms that are stronger, droughts that are worse and wreck in re and see the direct impacts today. We don't even have to look and think about the future. We can see what's happening right this moment. Right. Yeah. And we can have the wisdom to say, we want it, we need to do what we can to try and alleviate suffering yeah. today and in the future. And how is that going to look? You know, what does that mean to do that? Yeah. And even if, you know, people are more vo motivated by self-preservation or maybe preservation of their own family or whatever, I heard someone once tell me like cleaning up and putting things away and keeping things orderly 
is being compassionate for yourself in the future. So sometimes <laughs> when I'm in a hurry and I just have to throw something down and I can't put it away, I, I just, I'll literally say to myself, sorry, future Scott, <laughs> I'm leaving you a problem. <laughs> but, you know, so, so doing these things that aren't easy today is a way of being compassionate, not only for ourselves in the future, making our lives easier in the future, even though it's harder now, you know, it's for others, you know, whether it's, you know, you're motivated by your kids, your grandkids, or more selflessly people that you don't even know, right? That's right. But, you know, uh, I don't think there's one message. And I feel like sometimes both, I'm not going to get political, but the right and the left, they try, they talk to themselves rather than trying to think about things from other people's perspectives. And I know I'm guilty of this. I'm, everybody is. Sure. Um, so, you know, often I use messages or talk about things that work on me, right? Because, oh, this makes sense to me. I want to share that with other people. But it's really difficult to get into the mind of other people. So I try and think of people in my life that I care about that don't care about these things as much as I do, you know? So like, you know, parents, grandparents, people in my life who are you know, like, hey, I'm comfortable right now. I don't need to, you know, make any changes. It's like, well, okay, how do I get into their perspective and make those changes? And that's, yeah, it brings me to kind of like the different stories and things. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it to a minimum. Um, I'll just read one, but I don't know if folks out there are familiar with the, the book uh, Ecotopia, which was written by Ernst Kallenbach. Um, then he wrote a sequel or I guess a prequel called Ecotopia Emerging. I'll hold it up for those that are on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Haha. <laughs> Basically, the idea is that Northern California, Oregon, and Washington split off and created their own ecological utopia, as the, the name implies. It's a really interesting kind of thought experiment about how would you create environmental state that, that, that takes care, you know, self-sufficient and takes care of itself and tries to take care of its environment so that it doesn't get worse or in a way that's going not just for people but also for the plants and animals and other things that live there and it's it's dated clearly this is a uh, 1972 i think was ecotopia and this is 1981 so these are dated and I'll, I'll read this and you'll you'll get some of the dated language and the way they talk about it. it's more about straight up pollution rather than climate change because in the 80s the only people that knew about climate change were you know fossil fuel companies mm, <laughs> they were mm, keeping mm. it under wraps um so this is more about like pest you know this was after rachel carson's silent spring and so it was more about like pesticide and general environmental polluting rather than necessarily climate change but it's completely applicable and so what happens is there's a political party called the survivalist party which would not be the name that they would use if they rewrote this book today and they had a charismatic ish kind of grandmotherly leader who basically started to use stories to try and illustrate what was happening. So I'll read this. Apologies for just kind of reading something into the record, but it, it's, I think you'll see why I want to read it. And, and then we can chat about it at the other end and maybe think about other, other types of stories that might be useful. And this is an address from uh, Vera Alwyn, who is the, the leader of this party. I want to tell you a story. Once upon a time, I have heard there was a country entirely made up of lazy people. At first, they were just ordinarily lazy. And if they had the chance, they would always sit down rather than stand up. And if they could get someone else to serve their food, they'd prefer that to dishing it out for themselves. But they were also an ingenious people, and they soon realized that, since slavery had gone out of fashion, they could build machines to serve them. They invented machines to wash their dishes, dry their hair, stir their batters, and saw their wood and dig their holes. Slowly, decade by decade, they grew lazier and lazier. After somebody invented a machine called an automobile, their laziness increased by a great leap. They began to be so lazy that the idea of walking a block to buy a pack of cigarettes fatigued them terribly, and they would drive to the corner in their cars. They also invented a machine called a television to amuse themselves. Generally, they watched television in a half-sitting, half-lying slump, and they designed sofas to make their slumping position as comfortable as possible. Soon the lazy people learned that if you bought prefabricated meals called TV dinners, you could even eat this in TV slump and hardly move at all for an entire evening. Even their mouths grew lazy, since they didn't talk much when they were occupied by watching television, and most of them watched it all evening long. And their eyes too grew lazy, since watching television, they just focused their eyes on the screen and didn't have to move them around to look at things the way we do in real life. These lazy people soon grew fat, and they almost never got any exercise. They died of heart attacks in great numbers and had many other diseases caused by their lazy habits. But they didn't care, they thought this was natural. And it made them want to be lazier still. If anybody mentioned their terrible health statistics, they told them to go away and peddle their bad news someplace else. In time, a brilliantly lazy inventor, kind of 
oxymoron, contrived the ultimate machine for lazy people. <laughs> it was a large egg-shaped wheeled vehicle just big enough to hold one person made out of clear plastic. It had a slump-shaped seat in it, and it was called a char because it was half chair and half car. It had an electric motor of the kind that had first been used in motorized wheelchairs. Now the lazy people didn't have to use their legs at all and could still get around quite well, even in bad weather, using ramps and curb brakes and elevators originally designed for handicapped people. The chars were equipped with individual television sets and a microwave oven that, that could heat up a TV dinner. They had chemical potties under the seat so you didn't even have to go looking for a toilet. There was a radio intercom so you could talk to people nearby encased in their own chars. A stereo system could play you Mozart or rock. A computer console connected them to the entire centralized communication grid. Hmm. These chars came in many brilliant colors and you could get them with air conditioning and many optional chrome-plated accessories. They soon become immensely popular. After a while, it was rare to see anybody on the streets or in stores or in offices who was actually walking. Little prehensile tools were added to the chars, which people could manipulate from inside so they could continue to perform the necessary tasks. And the lazy people felt that, at last, they were ad achieved the kind of life which the universe owed them. They were very happy. For a while, because it soon turned out that there were drawbacks for the system, was deprived of exercise, their legs withered, and in time, the lazy people found themselves unable to extricate themselves from the chars. They never touched each other and never developed physical bonds of confidence and trust, or fell in love, or indeed expressed any lust, and so they produced no children. When they got sick, others were unwilling to get out of their chars to help them. They were now t too totally lazy and selfish. Indeed, they hardly ever helped each other at all, and sometimes they would get so provoked at each other that they would ram their chars into each other until one of them tipped over, or like cracked like an egg and its driver would lie there on the ground, kicking feebly with its withered legs like a little baby. And now if anybody criticized the char way of living, the lazy people were furious and pointed out that they had achieved the highest level of civilization the world had ever seen, and they were not about to give it up. But their laziness had also made them weak, and when they started dying off in large numbers, their neighbors began to take notice. Just to the north of the lazy people's country lived a barbarian people, well, that's a problematic word, uh, who survived mostly on nuts and berries and wild game. Their technology was pretty much limited to horses and fur coats and log cabins, but they spent most of their time outdoors, and they were tough and strong. They passed many hours singing, dancing, and making love, and playing rough games with their children. Sometimes they got into fights and punched each other, and then made up and swore eternal friendship. They understood plants and animals, and they had never seen a TV dinner. One day, a roving band of these barbarians galloped through part of the lazy people's country, which they noticed had quite a lot of nuts and berries, and saw what bad shape the lazy people were in. In a clumsy but friendly way, the barbarians tried to drag a few of the lazy people out of their chars, but they fell over helplessly as soon as they were on their feet and protested loudly, and tried to creep back into their chars where they felt safe. The barbarians laughed at this spectacle, and since they were not called barbarians for nothing, they began to push the chars off cliffs and into rivers just for the fun of it. Soon their barbarian friends came to join them, and in a few days there were no lazy people at all left alive. This story happened long ago in the old days. There are new lazy people now and new barbarians. What we need to do is to learn from history so we do not repeat it. You might have some fun retelling this story to friends or family in your own way. So that's the end of the... Yeah. Uh, so obviously there's some problematic stuff that we wouldn't write a story like that anymore today. Um, <laughs> and, you know, one thing I don't like about it is that it would affront some people, right? And people that enjoy that story might already be in the choir, right? So it's not really converting people, but the idea of a, of a political party or in this, in this case, you know, um, an ecologically minded group trying to use stories to spur people to action, both people that have already kind of started on that path and this might push them farther maybe with that story. But then we also need stories for people who are opposed to it and use a story to kind of, you know, not, I hate to say sneak in a message. That's not what I mean to do, but like, Look at it with new eyes, because mm -hmm. if you immediately, if you hear, oh, climate change, fossil fuels, whatever, people, especially now, automatically put up political barriers and they say, oh, this is from the other side. I don't want to hear it. And if you're using a story, maybe you can kind of circle around behind that, mm -hmm. that defensive wall and point out the obvious meteor hurtling towards us. And so, yeah, like, you know, just just look up. Similarly, it was preaching to the choir and those in the choir didn't really enjoyed it guiltily. But yeah, so and yes, obviously, apologies that, yeah, it's obviously dated, but the concept I think is found. <laughs> so my was, question is, since I've not read the book yet, yeah. is was this a story that the people of Ecotopia told each other? This was in the founding of Ecotopia. This was a public broadcast, like a political advertisement, basically. They were saying, come join our ranks. And they would use like parables and stories. They have another one okay. about a rich person and a poor person. And the rich person, you know, would buy like large swaths of wilderness and leave them wild. And then there's 
but then he would like fly out to visit it and do all these other things where he actually had a great impact on the environment, even though he was had money and means preserving it, trying to preserve it. And then there was a poor uh, person who used like public transit and had to garden, had quote unquote to garden and do all these things that were actually actually ecologically friendly because they were poor. And so it was basically, mm. you know, saying like, you know, they were they were pulling in religious connotations of like, you know, the meek shall inherit, you know, mm. or passing a rich man having trouble passing through the eye of a needle to get to heaven sort of idea, basically. But yeah, right. so they would use these and kind of turn them on their head for ecological purposes. And mm. I don't know, I, I think messages that are couched <clears throat> for some people in religion, I think would be helpful for those that aren't religious, obviously not. But I think the more diversity of stories out there, you know, if it just catches a few people, if you have enough of them, it would catch a lot of people. There's not one narrative. And it's kind of interesting, right? Because we really are talking about like the United States, like reaching Americans, because a lot of the rest of the world doesn't, doesn't need to be convinced. Yeah. 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 (laughs) You know, that's true. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) so there's, you know, the stories as they're going now are enough. You know, the right. news stories or whatever are enough to be, make people go, oh, yeah, that's bad. Now, now I don't know if that means that they're not flying as often if they're in a wealthier country or, right. you know, if they're changing their individual behavior. But they're certainly supporting politicians who are trying to enact some level of change. Yeah, I think I think there would be a, a really great story, like a short story out there that I, I've been noodling around with. I haven't come up with the right way to go about it yet, but basically talking about, you know, um, maybe a, a medieval appearing you know, society. And then all of a sudden they, mm. some sort of magic is invented and it's like a, a power source basically. Mm. Right. And then they convert mm. their lives to run this power source and the power source disappears, which obviously mm. is, you know, just us in parable form. But if right. you start out in a, in a different, completely different context, it relaxes mm. people away from, you know, their knee, knee jerk reaction to say like, Oh, defensiveness about, you know, gas, fossil fuels or climate change. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I think that's a, maybe useful way to try and, you know, uh, attract people to think differently about, about their situation. And maybe that's coming from, I mean, Mary, your spouse is a anthropological archeologist and yeah. you know, I'm, I'm from the same department, you know, so we, I don't know, and you've lived in different parts of the world. And I think it's easier for people that specifically look at other cultures very deeply to understand that the way we live right now is not the only way to live, but a lot of people don't mm have that perspective beat into their heads uh the way that we do uh, <laughs> through yeah many years yeah of definitely of that. yeah no it's it's a, it's a very interesting what i think is also kind of interesting is that so when you're talking about story right i feel like there has been this bit of a shift uh, recently of of thinking well okay the surface change thing isn't working we need to actually get to people on a different level that there is some sort of fundamental shift in attitude. And, and what does that entail? You know, that, and, and so we can talk even about like, how have you had a shift ever in your life of really a change in like worldview? Mm-hmm. And I don't mean just in terms of like, okay, yeah, accepting that climate change is real or thinking that plastic pollution is a problem, but like where something was, oh, I am now looking at the world a bit differently than I did before. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I ask that because, you know, that is, that is something that, you know, I think a lot of people in the arts see what they're doing as having that potential for presenting, giving people an opportunity to have that transformational experience, mm-hmm. you know, where they leave the space or whatever, they put the book down or they leave the gallery and they look at the clouds, for instance, mm-hmm. and they are not markedly different than they were two hours before. Mm-hmm. I mean, the shapes are different, but in terms mm-hmm. of their Comp- right. they're, they're, what yeah. they are made of and yet they might be completely different yeah the way that the person perceives them now i had one kind of experience like that now that you mention it like this discussion of course with a group uh, down the road called terra simple but they're no longer in business but basically it was, it was this exercise where you're supposed to go out at night on a clear night when the stars were shining lay down on the gr- on the grass and then really deeply imagine yourself not on top of the world but under the world with the world on top of you. And if you really imagine that, it's really hard not to just like dig your fingers into the grass and hold on like you're gonna fall off into space, you know? 
And it was just like, a, it was just like amazing how just that little thought experiment, like wow. really, you know, shifts your paradigm. And now mm. sometimes when I'm like out, you know, usually it happens when I'm driving because my mind is wandering. But like when I see the, the, the moon come up, I don't think of it because, you know, you see it, it looks kind of like two dimensional because it's so far away. Yes. You know, it's just this disc that goes over the sky. But really thinking about like, I am looking at a another planet out there and then the sun you know just try like really try and keep that perspective um i find to be helpful sorry you were talking about art and i wanted to circle back to something that you had mentioned um before we started recording about the protests recently and mm -hmm. i'll preface this by saying just for those that didn't catch it there have been controversial protests in europe where people have thrown uh, soup i think in both cases at uh famous artworks van gogh sunflowers and what was the other one Mona Lisa. Lisa, but yeah, and there, there's been, there's been like a mashed potatoes, tomato oh, mashed soup. Potatoes, that's uh, right. Yeah. There's been a few different things, but they've always chosen paintings that are protected by glass. Right. So that the painting itself will not get damaged. You know, I think it's not part of the, it, 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 I don't know if it's an offshoot of the extinct rebellion, extinction, re extinction, rebellion. extinction rebellion, but I think it's um, something, it's another group, stop all oil or something like that. I yes. don't know. It's three yeah. words. I mean, I'm not that's remembering. Right. But so provocative, right? That it's, you know, there's just so much conversation happening, mostly in, well, I, I should say from my limited little world, it's, you know, lots of condemnation, lots of saying that's not the way to do it. They're going to turn people off of the movement. And I'm like, turn people off the movement, really? And I, my first thought was, actually, as soon as I started seeing this quote unquote controversy around what, what they did, is I thought of this wonderful story of the Dalai Lama being asked in an interview about the French Revolution. They asked him, what do you think of, what do you think, you know, about the French Revolution and its effects yeah. on the world? And he said, it's too early to tell. And, you know, I mean, so true, right? So I, I you know, I, every time I've had a conversation with someone around that action, I was like, I, we, it's too early to tell. And no, there, we, we can accept, I would say, that there is not going to be one action that's going to shift things dramatically and that's it. And the whole right. world is going to be on the same page. This will never happen yeah. because human beings are super diverse and, you know, we all There's, have our own things. There is no one message. Yep. No. But I'm like, but on the other hand, I mean, you all are talking about it right now, right. you know? So like there's something happening there. So the group is called Just Stop okay. Oil. And I was so impressed because NPR Steve Inskeep did an interview with one of the protesters and it wow, wasn't. Great. And I was so impressed that it wasn't just, why would you destroy art? Why would you, da, 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 isn't this disrespectful? Da, da, da. That, that wasn't the line of questioning. The questioning was, I'm paraphrasing, what were the deeply held beliefs that would cause you to do this? Because this is a pretty mm. extreme act. What were, what's underlying this, this thing you did? And so they got to talk about, hey, you know what we did? We did road blockages. We did other types of like vandalism. We did all these things and nobody reacted. Nobody listened. Mm. Nobody mm. would, you know, listen to what we were saying. They were just annoyed mm. that they got home late that night and it wasn't mm. helpful. So we said, what can we do that will make people stop, really stop in their tracks and think, why would, you know, perfectly nice young people go and vandalize such, you know, iconic pieces of art. And, yeah. and maybe they would look into it and realize that we're not just doing this to be extreme. We're doing it because what's happening is extreme and nobody re it cares. Mm. Nobody seems, mm. because if we cared, we'd be doing something seriously about it, which we're not. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it was, it was a really good interview. I'll link to it in the show notes, but yeah, I was, I, was oh, very, yeah. I, I heard that the interview start and I just felt myself tighten up saying, oh, this is just going to be a exploration of the act and not the, the meaning behind it. So I was really excited about that. Well, I'm so happy that they also interviewed one of the actors in it. I mean, one of the, you know, protagonists, because so often, like in that kind of situation, it's all just, ex you know, you're going to talk to other people, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. about that, as opposed to the people who actually did it. So that's really, that's really interesting. I'm going to have to listen to that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll link to that in the show notes. Part of this uh, idea for this this episode of the podcast came to me because I had someone here visiting and volunteering one weekend to help me work on some projects. And he was asking me for suggestions for podcasts to listen to and books to read and, you know, uh, documentaries and all these different things. And it occurred to me that, like, I don't really listen to a lot of podcasts or document or things that are pointing a finger at the problem anymore. Mm -hmm. And. 
And I started to be concerned about that. Like, oh, I've lost my, my, you know, my hard, hardcore edge. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I don't really care about this. I'm so focused on what I'm doing here. I don't think of it or care about those things anymore. And I realized that wasn't true. It was that those uh, different types of media had done their job. They had gotten me to mm. think critically about how we live and say, okay, what change can I make? Originally, we had just thought about homesteading. And then I said, mm. no, I want to do research. I want to share this with other people. And that's why we started a nonprofit, mm. uh, the Low Tech mm. Institute. And so, and I realized, oh, that's so much like, and I don't mean to push a particular religious idea on anyone, but like, it's it, it, that's what like Zen enlightenment is like in some cases. You don't have to forever be a monk living in a monastery to be an enlightened person, right? That's one tool no. to get in there. In fact, yeah, but I mean, in fact, the there's, you know, way. it depends on the school, but, you know, uh, that's true. Certainly, like with Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, his teaching of socially engaged Buddhism, of which the 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 practice center that I'm a member of, Upaya Zen Center, is also in that tradition. Um, you know, is that that's not the path. The, the path is the bodhisattva path. So mm -hmm. one does not, you know, that you're. It is all about taking action. You know, um, beginning with the tenet of not knowing, approaching things with an open, you know, mm -hmm. an open heart. Secondly, is bearing witness to what's actually happening. So these mm -hmm. are the things you've done, right? Yep. And then third is compassionate action. So doing that within the having the wisdom of being present. You know, you're seeing mm -hmm. what's happening and then taking appropriate action. Hopefully. <laughs> You know, but having an understanding that, you know, you don't know, you don't know if it's going to work. I mean, that's the thing, right? So somebody put, put, putting soup on a fam famous painting does not actually know what the ramifications are going to be of that. Right. But they do know that that's not going to harm the painting. Right. So that's good, right? You know, so they're, they're taking an action that they know is radical on some mm -hmm. level, uh, but they know it's not going to be harmful to the object that they right. are revering that other people revere. Um, and then beyond that, what will happen? We don't know, and and the and the ramifications of it will maybe never be fully understood. Yeah, you know, but I I certainly think it has brought a lot of people into thinking a little bit more deeply about things. And when we do that, you know, like w one thing was interesting when you were reading the the section from Ecotopias, my I kept thinking like, wow, man, those Ecotopians are really judgmental. I'm like, yeah. man, they're talking yeah. about people Very being lazy. Lazy. And I'm like, so this is why they separated themselves, right? Like they were right. like, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And I'm like, right. wow, that's really kind of, you know, dystopian. And that's not really a utopian view, obviously. Um, it's yeah. certainly not the not the bodhisattva view. You know, right. it's not trying to it's help others it's, or serve others. It's about serving yourself, you know, and getting right. the hell out of there. And I'm just going to do what I need to do and yeah. find other like-minded people. Um, yeah. What I find is kind of fascinating, though, is that I feel like there has been more messaging around care for others you know and a lot of it has been like there is there is a difference i feel like with this much younger generation so-called generation z in part because they were you know all of the things that they're derided for wanting safe space all this other kind of stuff right mm -hmm. and like all those things actually kind of teach you to care about other people some level yeah you know yeah. um so whether or not they're derided you know and and okay so our larger culture is really about looking at care as something that is obligatory reciprocal or in some other way is not about gifting and so maybe there is starting to be this kind of tiny little shift you know of this opening up of through through those those little things that have happened over the last 15 years yeah. of kind of of the teachers of the parents of everybody kind of being exposed to this idea of like mm -hmm. trigger warnings i mean it sounds horrible you know and safe spaces and whatever but in reality all those things are about like you know what i actually don't want this person in my class to feel terrible so maybe what we can do is create some space for this person to not feel terrible not to feel like they shouldn't exist in the world or at least not be okay, surprised because, you know, if you've had a traumatic yeah, right. experience, as if you know, hey, right. this class we're going to be talking about X, then they know, oh, okay, I'm not going to be surprised walking into this and all of a sudden, like, having something That's right. traumatic That's from my right. past dragged up with no warning, at least. Yeah. And one can argue, you know, like, is that ultimately super helpful? We don't know. Uh -huh. We'll see. Uh -huh. You know, we also want to help kids become resilient. But hey, you know what? We, all of us adults too, are really struggling to become more resilient and yeah. more compassionate and more generous and everything else. So, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a lifelong kind of process. So yeah, it's interesting that, you, you know, to me, for, for myself and my own, like kind of story that I think of my own awakening around climate catastrophe, climate collapse. I mean, I feel like there's even the language we use is kind of yeah. weak about it, you know, I'm like change. 
yeah like no change yeah. yeah it is and it doesn't capture it you know no. um but if we think about climate collapse you know i i really feel like the the teachings of interdependence and interconnectedness are the things that brought me into a different, a totally different way of looking at the world. And part of that was through, we, you'd mentioned um, before we started recording, Alan Watts, but, and of course, Thich Nhat Hanh, who was kind of my, one of my first kind of Zen teachers, mm -hmm. you know, and he would teach about like a piece of paper. He said, he held up a piece of paper. He said, you know, with, with insight, I can see that the, in, within the piece of paper is a cloud and the rain that, that, you know, and the seed of the of the tree and the growth of the tree and the soil and the fungus, all these things are in present in the and of course the people who cut down the tree and milled it and mm -hmm. you know and pulped it created the paper. Like all of that is present in the paper, mm -hmm. you know. And I have to say that one teaching, I mean I, I remember listening to it when we were living in New Orleans and like literally everything around me changed. It's you know, I mean experience or yeah. Completely. I mean so absolutely everything I looked at, I was like, wow, everything contains all of this whole universe. Mm -hmm. You know, if I look at a cup and I think about what came, what made that cup, if I think of the table and what, how the table is, what it really is, yeah. it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's mind blowing, yeah. you know, but in a very beautiful way, you know, and it's not about faith and it's mm -hmm. not about belief. Mm -hmm because it's, there's no way you could argue otherwise. There is no, that is the truth of the world. Yeah. The piece of paper really does come from all these non-paper elements, as he right. would say. Well, the you beginning know? of the universe. I mean, the the sun is, you know, elements from the- great Yes, great made of non-sun elements, you yeah. know? We are all that. We are all made of non-us yeah. elements. And so this, this is an, such a deeply profound teaching and when you start to really think about it in your daily life like just reminding yourself when you pick up your toothbrush this yeah. toothbrush is made of non-toothbrush elements you know <laughs> it it changes the way you look at things and you suddenly are feeling like wow i need to be more gentle in the world mm. i need to be more uh thoughtful i need to not be so mindlessly consumptive i need to not be so coarse or judgmental or any of these things mm. i need to loosen up now will that teaching touch everyone not necessarily i mean i had a conversation with a friend who's going through a bit of a marriage difficulty right now and i just mentioned that that story again of imagining you and your partner in 100 years mm -hmm. and she was like well we'd be 140 and i'm like no you'd be dead you guys are going to be dead in 100 yeah. years None of us are going to be alive in a hundred years, you know, <laughs> you know, and she's like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? And I said, well, what is that? How does that put what, what you're going through right now into perspective? Does yeah. it? I don't know. It might not, Yeah. you know, but just give it a shot. See what happens the next time you're touching this, your partner, just try it out. See what happens. I'm like even opening up to the curiosity around things right. and like being willing to try something Yeah. like what, what would happen if I just actually thought that maybe my actions are having ramifications or that, that maybe we will have that maybe burning fossil fuels is really causing climate change what what changes if i think that yeah i mean you know hopefully we can just encourage people to just start even being curious about stuff like that you know that, yeah that's got to be the key and i think that'll help break people out of the ruts uh that we get stuck in you know we, we we're just so used to it and we don't question it because I mean, the fish doesn't think about water because it lives mm. in it. You know what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. very difficult for us to question the way that we live in, yeah, in in this in a economy and society that is really made to minimize friction. Uh, and the mm. way that we met, we have chosen to minimize friction is by using a lot of power to do so. Mm. You know, uh, minimizing friction. friction and yet politically encouraging friction. I mean, it's kind yeah, of a fascinating true. thing. You yeah. know, I mean, personal friction, like, oh, I understand. I'm cold, I'm cold for a minute. Oh, I don't want yeah. that. So I'm going to heat That's my whole right. house, you know. That's right. Discomfort and safety. Yeah, discomfort. I mean, yeah. I mean, we should we should have a conversation sometime around those two concepts because yeah. of how powerful they are in yeah, really driving powerful. so much of what our society is. Wanting safety, a feeling of safety. Right. And, you know, not that that involves things not changing. For and 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For me, for me, safety is <laughs> for, things changing, at least from my point of view right now, right? Definitely. We need to change yeah. things to a way that can exist post fossil fuels and to absorb climate change. But yeah, for many, and I think this is probably not universal, but you know, if you come at it, I, I think even people who completely disagree and who want to use a lot of, and don't care about climate change or don't accept it, whatever, it's because they want their family or themselves to be comfortable and Yes. That's pretty human and totally, mm. I understand mm -hmm. that too. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm just, I see a different, you know, perspective of what will be comfortable for me is maybe not being comfortable today, but being less uncomfortable tomorrow, you know? Mm. So mm. yeah, it's very difficult, but um, I wanted to end on Alan, a short clip from Alan Watts, just kind of to bring us back to the usual podcast stuff where I don't discuss this stuff very much because <laughs> Um, as Alan Watts will describe, talking about this stuff is kind of like a brick, a scaffold, or a boat. So here. So in other words, it's like when you erect a building, while you're building it, you have all kinds of scaffolding up. That shows uh, you that building is going on. But when the building is complete, the scaffolding is taken down. To open a door, as they say in Zen, you may need to pick up a brick to knock at the door. But when the door is open, you don't carry the brick inside. To cross a river, you need a boat. But when you've reached the other side, you don't pick up the boat and carry it. So the brick, the boat, the scaffolding, all these things represent some sort of religious technology or method. And in the end, these are all to disappear so that the saint will not be found in church. I don't take what I say literally. The saint can perfectly readily go to church without being sullied by church. But ordinary people, when they go to church, they come out stinking of religion. So, yeah, no offense to, I don't mean it in that, you know, specific religious way, but when people want to discuss the climate catastrophe and, and these sorts of things, it, it almost, there's another clip I'll, I'll play to close it out, uh, it makes me sick to my stomach almost because it's like, yeah, that's really stressful. And I'm, yeah, you know, like we changed around a lot of how we live to try and work through and deal with that and think about it in a, in a useful, helpful way. And so like rehashing that, it's just like revisiting uh, something in my past that I'm like, wasn't pleasant to deal with. And I've come through mm -hmm. the other side now and I feel positive about how we're moving forward, but it, yeah, it, it's tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's tough. Cause I want to be <laughs> there for them when they need that discussion, you know, but it's, it's hard to re go through it myself. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if that huh. strikes anything with you. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to hearing what it is that you're talking about, like, you know, the exact thing that you're talking about in terms of like revisiting that conversation or. Yeah. 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 Someday we'll have to go into more detail. Well, and I wonder how to, I mean, I know where you have to end. Sorry. I'm <laughs> it's just, it's so thought provoking. It's so thought provoking. How to alleviate some of the discomfort and pain. Yeah. Because. I think that that is part of, once again, that's kind of the Bodhisattva's role, right? Mm -hmm. So in some ways it's about being that, that, that scaffolding that's, mm -hmm. that helps with that building, Yeah. you know, um, and, and having note, the, the, yeah. Uh, for those that don't know what a Bodhisattva is, a Bodhisattva is someone who's realized enlightenment, but has foregone uh, breaking free of this world and has stayed to help others make the same realization. Until all beings are Until liberated. Beings. Yep. And, you know, that means all beings, not just human or even animal, right. but, you know, so it's an impossible task, right? So it's never, it's, not, it's never ending, right. you know, yeah. uh, but it's that commitment to that. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Yeah. It's all but good. Yeah. It's all good. But yeah. And yeah, for, you know, for me, cause I've been trying to think about that too. Like, how do we you know, one way, and this is what I try and do here with kind of some of the stuff we have going on is to show like, not only is it an alternative to live in a more local kind of self, uh, not self-reliant, but locally reliant way, but it's actually in some ways more advantageous. Like we were just talking with my mother the other day about, you know, grocery bill. And it's like, well, a lot of our food comes from our, pro so our grocery bill is really small. And we've been really insulated, thankfully, from the um, from the inflation uh, that's been really rampaging through uh, a lot of uh, food costs because it's so t fossil fuel derived. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's 
it's we eat well and we live you know fairly well because we've kind of designed ourselves to be insulated from these things and so that mm -hmm. kind of you know mm -hmm. to show like it's not just living in it's not taking a vow of poverty or a, a vow of being uncomfortable all the time it's actually to live in a more comfortable way mm -hmm. uh, just a way mm -hmm. that's more reasonably adapted for a future that is different than what it is today and it is just a shift, right? I mean, like it's, we think of it as being a convenience to go to the grocery store or something like that. I mean, and on one level it is, I suppose. But when you think about the harm that's caused by that whole system, it becomes a little less convenient, you know? Well, in which yeah. case growing your food is 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 perhaps actually more convenient in a, in a spiritual way. You know? And surprisingly even more cost-effective. There were studies done in the 30s with people growing mm -hmm. their own food. Like you can grow food for less than you can actually buy it. Um, yeah. Depending on how you do the accounting. But basically if you look at, you know, you think industrial production is so efficient. Yeah. But then they have marketing and transportation and other costs that you don't have in your backyard. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. actually it's, you're, you're quite an efficient food grower yourself. You can compete with industrial food production. <laughs> but anyway, um, Kate, I feel like we could continue talking. <laughs> we might have to make I know. parts anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me today. And thank you for inviting me. It was so interesting. I just love our conversations. Uh, yeah. They are they are really nourishing, truly. So, good. so after my talk with Kate uh, yesterday, I've been thinking more about that <clears throat> reading I did from Ecotopia Emerging. And I considered taking it out and cutting out all of our discussion about it in the in the podcast episode because, yeah, it is kind of judgy and uh, not very kind to people who are understandably enticed uh, into a comfortable, easy life. We all fall into that a lot of times and because comfort is comfortable. And so I do feel a little uh, conflicted about how it demonizes people. I just feel difficult. I feel slightly conflicted about how that that kind of um, puts people down, um, and so I decided on uh, in the end to leave it in, um, as you heard, uh, because that was you know 1981, and I think we've moved on since then um, to different problems and also different ways of trying to be interacting with our 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 fellow human beings and maybe trying to coax them along rather than put them down and shame them because that. Nobody likes that. It doesn't help anybody. And so that should serve as more of a challenge. How are we going to reach people who are very comfortable right now to potentially give up that comfortable life for a, a different life that could be comfortable or could be very uncomfortable depending on what decisions we make? We're trying to get people to make the good decisions so that they can continue to live in a comfortable way, a, diff a very different way, but also, you know, comfort can come in different forms. So I'm leaving it in, even though on reflection, it's not the strongest story. So maybe uh, in the next episode or two, you will hear me come up with my own stories, um, probably pulled from the ancient world, talking about uh, societies that have done well and not so well with the challenges that face them. All right. So that's it for this week. Uh, the Low Technology Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. The show is hosted and co-produced by me, Scott Johnson, and co-produced and edited by Hina Suzuki. This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute's recording room uh, because it's winter and I can't be in the gardens. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you enjoyed this free podcast. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. Thanks to our forester and land steward level members, Marilyn Skirpon, Sam Brown, and the Hanvises for their support. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grant, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute membership and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media and reach me directly. I'm Scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was Some Things Out There off of the album of the same name by Holisna. That song is in the public domain, and this podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Like License, meaning you're free to use and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks so much, and take care.